There was a sad story about a young American monk who went to Thailand, or a young American who went to Thailand and became a monk. He went to stay with the John Mahabua. One of the first questions he asked a John Mahabua on arrival was, what meditation theme can I follow that will lead me to awakening? And John Mahabua said, I don't know, you have to find out for yourself. Now the young monk thought that that meant that Ajahn Mahabhu didn't know the way to awaken and got discouraged and left, disrobed. Tried Zen for a bit, disrobed from that, ended up being a professor here in the States. And the sad thing, of course, is that he misinterpreted Ajahn Mahabhu's statement. Ajahn Mahabhu didn't say that he didn't know the way to awaken, but what he didn't know was what would work specifically for that young monk. Because there is no one technique that's guaranteed to take you to stream entry or once returning or non returning or arhanship. It's a matter, matter of individual temperament. There are two main practices where the Buddha divides them there's painful practice and there's pleasant practice. And it doesn't mean that you sit here with a lot of pain or you sit here with a lot of pleasure. Painful practice is having to contemplate the body as your main. Main main theme. It's painful because it's not a pleasant, pleasant theme to follow. Pleasant practice has to do with getting into the jhanas and working with a sense of ease and refreshment that come from getting the mind really still. Now, this doesn't mean that with body contemplation you don't get into jhana. In both cases, the Buddha said, what determines whether your practice is going to be pleasant or painful is which kind of contemplation leads you to develop the five strengths and the five faculties? Conviction, persistence, mindfulness, concentration, and discernment. Now, concentration in both cases means the jhanas. But the theme leading you to develop those jhanas, and from there on into discernment, is something that varies. Some people can just work with the jhana itself, i.e. you look at the state of mind and say, whatever state of concentration you have, and you see, where is there stress still here? When you see anything that you're doing to cause the stress, and you notice that by noticing the rise and fall of the level of stress in the mind. You can catch the activity that brings that on right then and there. Drop that activity. You're learning the basic skill that will take you all the way. At the very least, a stream entry. Because it's all about seeing the activities of the mind. It's the same with concentration that comes from contemplating the body. At first you're focused on your image of the body, but then there comes the question, well, what is the perception that makes you want to give rise to a, say, an unpleasant image of the body as opposed to an attractive one? And what is this thing, this perception of attractive and unattractive? You learn to turn around and look at that, take that, that apart. So in both, both cases you're learning how to look at the role of perception in your mind, the role of feeling and fabrication, all these kind of the central aggregates. And that makes you more and more sensitive to what the mind is doing to deceive itself, what the mind is doing to create unnecessary suffering for itself. But as to which of the two main themes you fall into, or two main types you fall into, you don't know that beforehand. This is one of the reasons why we practice both body contemplation and breath meditation. Contemplate the 32 parts of the body. You can add other parts of the body, if you like. For some reason, eyes are not mentioned in the list. You can visualize them to yourself. Just go down the list. And when you focus on a particular body part, ask yourself, well, where in my body, my sense of the body sitting right here, is that part right now? To drive home the fact that it's not just something in an anatomy chart or in a picture you may have seen. It's something right there in your body. You've been living with your liver, you've been living with your lungs all this time without really thinking much about them. And just go through the various parts until you find one part that really captures your your interest really seems to hit you that, oh my gosh, my body has that too. 
and I've been carrying it around. Anything that gives you a sense of questioning your attachment to the body and taking for granted that your body is a really cool thing. This is not to say the body is a bad thing. After all, you've got to use the body for the practice. What you're trying to cut through is your unhealthy positive and negative images of your body. Unhealthy negative images are the idea that it's just, just me who's ugly. It's not beautiful like all those other people we see in the media. Unhealthy positive images, saying, you know, I've got this really cool body here, I'm pretty, I'm pretty sharp. Both of those are unhealthy because they lead to unhealthy mind states. A healthy positive image is that I've got a body that I can practice with. A healthy negative image is one that sees we're all equal in terms of what we've got in our bodies. And none of the parts are really all that attractive when you take them out. So it's good to do this practice on a regular basis to help loosen your attachment to the body. It helps in lots of, lots of ways. It's not just the attachment of lust. And it's interesting that the Buddha's analysis of lust is you start with the fact that you like your body and then you go to the body of the opposite sex or wherever it is you're attracted to. But it starts with your body. But this analysis is not just for lust. Whatever kind of attachment you have to the body. It may be the unwillingness to do without food or to do without sleep for fear that it's going to do something to the body. You say, well, the body is here to be used. And there comes a point where you're going to have to throw it away anyhow. So use it in a good way. People who look after their bodies, preserve their bodies, what are they preserving them for, usually? In most cases, it's just preserving them so they look good until they can't really look good anymore. That doesn't accomplish anything. So you have to ask, have to ask yourself, to what extent am I unwilling to use the body for something that really have a good impact on the mind? And then looking at the various parts of the body, saying there's really nothing here that's worth holding on to for its own sake. You learn to see the body as a tool. This is all very helpful. Whether it turns out your practice is going to be painful, i.e., the analysis or the theme that ultimately leads to awaken is the body, or if it's pleasant. Either way, you've got to do this kind of contemplation on a regular basis. The same in the other case, even if your practice is painful, the Buddha says you've got to have the breath, at the very least, as your escape, because there are times when body contemplation can get the mind really upset can lead to unskillful mind states, and that's when you've got to drop that and come back to the breath. Give yourself, give yourself a sense of well-being, of refreshing the mind. Because the mind needs its refreshment on the path. After all, it's going to be feeding anyhow. And if it doesn't have something really good to feed in terms of the concentration, it's going to go slipping out, jumping over the wall, finding something outside to, to feed off of, to find its hit of pleasure. So give it something good right here, something that is skillful, something that is going to help anchor you in the present moment and put you in a position where you really can see what's going on in the mind. Because the breath is the closest thing in the body to the mind. It's through the breath or the energy of the breath that you can actually move your body and be sensitive to what's going on in the body. So staying with the breath focuses you right at the mind and creates a good relationship between the body and the mind. So whether your practice is going to be painful or pleasant, it's good to have some experience with both sides, both because nobody can know which side you're on, and secondly, because it helps give balance to both sides. So be alive to the fact that there are lots of different ways, lots of different themes, and the Buddha lists many different themes in the, in the suttas. It's even possible to work with metta as the basis for your concentration or any of the Brahma-viharas. 
And as long as you then use that as a, a basis for further developing the factors for awakening, and particularly the discernment about what you're doing as you create a state of mind, that too can be one of the pleasant ways of gaining awakening. But it all has to come down to your ability to watch your own mind as it's creating unnecessary stress and suffering through its perceptions and feelings and fabrications here in the present moment. Now, whatever theme leads you to that level of awareness, and where it's easy for you to see what you're doing and where the unnecessary stress is and how you don't have to create it, that'll be the method that works. It's part of the Buddha's greatness as a, t as a teacher is realizing that there are these different personality tendencies, and there are these different ways of dealing with your different tendencies. So that regardless of your tendency, there is a way for you to develop awakening. 